My name is Annie Lai. I'm a chair of Generative AI Commons. And um, yesterday, you heard Jim Zemlin's keynote about model openness framework. It is a very important work to show the openness of uh, uh, a model. And because the, you all know there's a lot of open washing going on, and we really need to have a, a tool to show how open a model is. So today, uh, in today's session, we're going to talk to you about uh, model openness framework more. But before that, I want to spend a few minutes to talk about the organization I represent, Generative AI Commons. So Generative AI Commons um, was created last December. We were created to help further the advancement of generative AI technologies via open source and uh, open science. And um, we have currently have op uh, over 200 active members from uh, 80 organizations. And it is um, a brain, uh, is a thought leadership platform for uh, Gen AI um, ideas, concepts, and it's also a collaborative platform for um, open source projects in Gen AI. So it is all about the people, because um, what we have is um, we subscribe to non-membership, uh, kind um, non-membership, um, non so anybody in the world can join and participate, and hopefully you can contribute. And I host a bi-weekly meeting at 7 a.m. PST, which is about your 10 p.m. Um, Thursday morning, uh, Thursday night. And um, apologize for the time because we want to accommodate to all three regions, North America, Asia Pacific, and Europe. So that's why we have that meeting every other Wednesday. And one feature is we would um, have a feature speakers um, thought leaders who come to our meeting and talk about the, what they're working on. So I highly you know, recommend you join the meeting and um, it's a Zoom call. And um, all of our um, track uh, leaders are uh, volunteer based and um, we build thought leadership and also we work on you know, uh, project, open source projects in the Gen AI space. Currently we have uh, four work stream groups. The first one is called MAD, um, stands for Model Application Data. We work on projects in the model application data space, and um, these people are definitely passionate, and not just MAD, they're passionate about, you know, Gen AI. And we're currently working on uh, building a landscape, and then uh, after that we'll work on building a reference architecture, best practice, and ecosystem. And we have a responsible AI work stream. Actually, I'm giving a talk on that later at five o'clock. Uh, please come to the responsible AI, um, my talk. And as you know, that Gen AI is happening really quickly. And while we are moving towards more faster, bigger models, we need to also think about being responsible, building responsible AI. And in that talk, I'm gonna talk about the eight tenants that supports a responsible AI and what we can do as an open source community to help build responsible AI. And we have an education outreach work stream where we develop a ton of you know, webinars, materials. We have a glossary published, and we also have, um, we also have other um, blogs, and if you want to learn about the latest regarding Gen AI, please go to uh, genaicommons.org uh, uh, Gen website. Last but not least is our framework um, workstream. This is the workstream that uh, created the model openness framework and model openness tool. This is what today's talk is about. And um, here I'd like to welcome uh, Matt, who is, I call him the grandfather of uh, MOF. He's one of the original authors of the MOF paper and he's gonna get into more details about MOF. And please get involved, thank you. All right, normally I would be upset being called a grandfather when I just had a baby, but um, I'll let that one pass. Uh, so my name is Matt White. I'm the executive director of the PyTorch Foundation and the GM of AI at the Linux Foundation. And I am also one of the authors on the Model Openness Framework paper. So probably going to get a lot of hands from Jim's talk yesterday, but just a quick show of hands. Who's familiar with the MOF or has heard of, heard of it previously or attended the keynotes yesterday? All right. So there's some, there's a genesis or a reason why we put this together, right? And in AI is kind of 
it's been around for a while, but obviously with the um, you know the the growth in interest in AI and investment and usage of AI, especially with LLMs and more powerful models, uh, we've seen a, a number of issues in the industry that are that really provoked the, this work. And so, when someone says what's you know open AI or open source AI, there's not a very clear definition of, of what that is. We have open source concepts that we know, but it's not very clear uh, what, what's happening with AI. And so because of that, there's a lot of, as Annie alluded to, open washing, which is when a model producer releases a model and says it's open source, but it's really released under a restrictive license. The other challenge is, is the transparency with all these new models that are being published very, very quickly. They are usually only releasing the model architecture and a final set of weights but they're not releasing any intermediate weights or checkpoints. They're not releasing the code that was used to train and all of the hyperparameters and um, in the data sets as well. And so we we're also seeing like these licenses be developed that are purporting to be open, but they're, they're not in fact open, right? They use the word open, but they um, have very like key restrictions that limit usage. So here's a quick glimpse at some of the open licenses that we're all very familiar with uh, and contrasted with uh, proprietary restrictive licenses that models have been released under. And so in, in we have you know, Apache 2.0, Mistral has adopted Apache 2.0 for a lot of their, their models. And then contrast that with uh, Stable Diffusion, which has used OpenRail, which is a, a restrictive license. And so conventional OSS software, like open source software licenses cover effectively software documentation and then libraries and tools that are associated with that. But deep learning is much more complex. Machine learning is much more complex. And so we have a lot more different artifacts that go into the process of developing deep learning models. Um, I will touch a little bit deeper on this in a further slide. But effectively, we break that down into code, data, and documentation. So just kind of touch on the challenges. There's a the movement towards black box uh, deployments, chat GPT, GPT-4, uh, Claude 2, and so forth, um, have really clouded the you know, transparency and, and created a little bit of concern around safety and security, right? And so we kind of stepped in here with this model openness framework, which is a very you know, evolving framework that is geared towards model developers or producers, as we call them. And the audience for this is, is downstream, which are the consumers of, of models. Uh, it is a three-tiered classification system, which evaluates code, data, and documentation components. And really, there's extra value here for researchers and developers because there's a community of AI researchers that aren't familiar with open source, and there's an open source community that's not very familiar with AI, and so we're sort of bridging that gap with, with this work. So oh, there's a lot of things open, right? Uh, it can be very confusing, and uh, we're trying to sort of address that with, with this work, right? Get down to what is open science. Um, and open science, if you've, you're familiar with the term or you've, you know, PhD student or postdoc or done additional research, um, will understand that open science breaks down, uh, break down a lot of barriers, right? To help advance scientific research and um, the, the open sharing of data, information, um, and research methodologies. And so, Part of this is open access, which tears down paywalls so that you can access uh, research quite easily. Um, the concept of open data, which is we're sharing data openly without requiring any uh, license agreements to be signed. And then open source is a part of this as well. So in the paper, we explain two concepts that are, we borrow from open science, which is completeness. Uh, and so this is a dimension of what components are actually being released when you release a model and uh, in its weights. And so that is those 16 components I showed a little bit earlier and we'll touch back on in a moment. And then we have openness, which is a very binary concept of it's open or it's not open. There's no in between. And that is pertains to the licenses. 
So if a component is released, it needs to be released with an open license for it to be considered, in fact, open. So circling back to these 17 components in the MOF, under the code, we have our model architecture, which is really that core piece of, of when you couple it with your model weights is the core piece of any distribution. Uh, there is a lot of code that goes involved in the process of developing models. And so we have you know, data pre-processing code that we use to parse the data. We've got you know, associated libraries and tools, and then the training and inference code, which are used to both train the model and then run inference and run benchmark tests. Uh, very importantly, we have data sets with a pre-trained data, or it's going to be fine-tuned data, or even potentially reinforcement learning from human feedback type data. Uh, we've got model metadata. We've got the weights and parameters, as I alluded to. And on the documentation side, this is where we get insight into the work that was done to develop the model, right? So research papers are very descriptive, very detailed, where we may have a technical report, which is a little bit more high level and describes the model in, in more abstract terms. And so taking all these components, we decided, OK, how are we going to chunk them up to create a classification system that would allow for different uses and, and very clear um, ranking of, of models as they're released? And so we have this concept of an entry level model, which is a class three open model. This is the model architecture. That's the code that is the basis for the model. We have the parameters, usually the final checkpoint. Um, we have a technical report that's accompanying that some evaluation results, model card, and data card, right? These are, this is the minimum viable product that you need to be able to use a model in your business, to be able to use it for um, research or to modify it, fine tune it, and, and use it for other downstream or domain specific usages. And so we thought, okay, well maybe we need something a little bit more, which is this intermediate class, which is open tooling. And so this is the code that supports all the training, inference code, evaluation code, and any evaluation data. This, this not only allows you to, to replicate um, part of the process, but also allows you to give you insight into what hyperparameters were used, how the model was trained, potentially when data was introduced in the model uh, training process. And so this, this provides more transparency into the work that is behind that model. And then we have class one, open science. This is what we sort of aspire to. Um, examples of this would be, you know, Pythia from, from Eleuther AI uh, and Olmo from um, Allen Institute. There's some other models out there that meet this required, these criteria. But this is the research paper. This describes the entire you know, process behind the development of the model, any behavioral uh, elements to the model, any evaluations. And then we've got, some additional stuff here, which is really these um, model parameter intermediate checkpoints, which will allow you to go back in the training process and pick up training from any given point. Uh, and it helps you, gives transparency in how the model training model was trained and uh, how it developed over time. So this is a very busy slide, but effectively we took all of these components, we decided what domain they belong in, whether it's model or data, we then evaluate the content type, which is either data, code, or documentation. And we had to do that to understand the content type to allocate the appropriate license for that particular um, modality. And so for, you know, we really prefer CDLA when we're, we're talking about data, any OSI approved model for source code, and then for any documentation, CC by 4.0 or CC0 or another license is, is perfectly acceptable as long as it is a permissive license. So how do you implement the MOF? Um, well, we developed this model openness tool, which takes care of a lot of the functionality. And so it's expected that the developer will put license files in the component um, repositories. And so as you might develop open source software and release that, there's a single license file in the root of your, your GitHub repo. Here, we have multiple license files that are attributed to the different components within the distribution. And that those file, the model openness tool allows model producers to generate this JSON file automatically that includes all the licenses in the appropriate locations and goes and classifies the particular model and issues you a badge that you can drop into your readme markdown file in your GitHub repo. 
We also track progress, um, qualification and progress for models. So some of the benefits uh, you know, to model producers, those that are training these models, is really how do, what, what license should they use in, in releasing a model, right? And what components should they include? And we're pushing towards more components with more open licenses. And it really enables reproducibility. So if one organization releases a model, another organization can pick that up and improve upon it. And then you know, collectively, the entire community benefits. Uh, improve transparency, performance, security of models through red teaming. There's a lot of really good uh, aspects that can be um, derived from this work. But the effectively, we're, we're talking about pushing producers to release more components and use open licenses. That's key here. And then downstream, we have the model consumers, the users of models, right? And so this, the MOF allows model consumers to understand what it is they're getting and what they can do with it, right? That's very important. If you're going to create a startup and you have no idea what these components are included and what the licenses allow you to do, uh, or if you have sort of discontiguous licenses within a distribution, um, that makes it very hard to build a business around, right? So just some limitations that we, remar we remarked through our work. Uh, it is very much tailored towards deep learning, right? That's the current paradigm. But we could adopt this for you know, conventional machine learning models or you know, reinforcement learning, uh, imitation learning models as well. Uh, data sets are a challenge, right? Most of the data set, sorry, most of the data in these, these pre-trained data sets is in fact copywritten. Um, and there's a hesitancy to release those into, into the public. Um, and then, uh, you know, we don't really know, we're not really trying to address concerns of bias, security, safety. These are things that are handled by alternate frameworks, right? And, you know, the responsible AI working group is, is also looking into that. So I'm going to give you a quick glimpse into the model openness tool. Um, I feel very uncomfortable trying to do a live demo, so I'm going to give you screenshots. Uh, and so if you go to isitopen.ai, that is where the model openness tool lives. Um, this is a little bit of a, uh, a dev screenshot, so there's no such model as open science, but we just wanted to show that an open science classification will rank you at the top. And so you can think of this as like a scoreboard, right? All of the top transparent, the top models that qualify across all the, across this, all classes will be at the top. And then we kind of work our way down uh, based on progress. And for those that are developing models, you can go come here and without having to submit it, you can evaluate your model. Uh, you can get a suggestion on what licenses to use. And so you can click an option. It will allow you to populate the license fields and um, then you don't really have to, to put too much consideration into it. And then if you do decide to submit a model to the score, to the leaderboard, uh, you submit it through the, the submit form. Um, and you can, you basically, all of these you know, model details, code components, data components, are all those components that we, we talked through earlier. And you just basically have to assign a license to each one of those things before submitting. And so if you'd like to get involved, this, the model openness framework is an active, uh, fluid, very fluid document. Uh, we make updates probably every few weeks now. Um, and, and so we're looking to gauge the communities, what their thoughts are on it. Also, the model openness tool, we're currently working. We have uh, researchers that are published, or sorry, pu uh, evaluating models right now. And we're publishing those to the model openness tool as well. And that brings us to Q&A. Any questions? Yeah, so that we are, we have conversations in, in flight with um, various model developers. Uh, some of them are very receptive. Others are uh, concerned, especially around the data piece, right? Um, they don't want to be sued. And uh, Anthropic was just sued. Uh, 
it's it's kind of happening right now. And so, because the there's no legislation really covering this, um, folks are a little concerned. And so I don't I don't predict that we're going to see very much open science models, but we'll definitely see a lot of the open models out there. And um, you know, several folks are looking at adopting more appropriate licenses. I think one of the things that I sort of skipped over was that we don't believe that you know Apache 2.0 is designed for model weights, right? Model weights are you know is data. They're higher. It's higher dimensional data, and it's not covered in conventional software licenses. And so this is the area that we're trying to really focus on to get folks you know adopting the most appropriate licenses. Yeah, there's um, so some of them are at that at the open science level. Uh, that would be like Eleuther AI's Pythia, um, Allen Institute's Olmo. There's you know a lot of these that are actually just they have released the data sets, right? Um, they've released the model architecture, the weights. Uh, L, I think the one that's closest to open science is LLM 360 because they're actually releasing intermediate checkpoints. So while the model was training, they took a snapshot and they're distributing those snapshots. And so they're kind of like, you know, far and ahead of everybody else. Um, but the open model classification is really what we really want folks to sort, sort of focus on because then we can actually grow the amount of models out there. And then what happens is there's competition and people were like, I want to have a more transparent model. I want to release more components. Um, and upstage my competitors, right? And make this very competitive. And that's, you know, we have a, a leaderboard, right? And that allows you to see who's really ranking highest. And so um, yeah, it's an important factor. All right, well, thank you very much. Appreciate it.